Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I would like to welcome all of you to today's program, which is called Confronting Hard History, Using Primary Sources to Teach Slavery, Civil Rights, and Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> and this uh, is sponsored by ProQuest today. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. Um, Please know that all of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are disabled, so don't worry about generating background noise or feedback or anything like that. We've got that taken care of. Um, you should be able in the main area of the screen to follow along with the presentation materials. Um, and we are using the Q&A feature today. Um, so please use that as the place where you put questions to each of uh, to our speakers um or for the folks from proquest and then please use the chat box for um any technical issues that you have and i will troubleshoot you, those with you there um please also note we're recording today's program and everyone who signed up should receive a follow-up email within about 24 hours of the presentation today with a link to that recording um if you're finding the, the chat or um, the Q&A boxes uh, annoying, you can always minimize those um, to keep them out of view. And um, if you're having trouble viewing the slides on the screen, um, you can resize those. Um, I think that is everything. So I will take a second here uh, to turn it over to Barbara, who I believe is going to be doing Dr. Jeffrey's introduction today. Yes, I am. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Barb Olson. I am a product marketing manager for ProQuest, um, and I am responsible for our primary sources and historical collections. Um, I've spoken to many of you before in previous ACRL webinars, so thank you so much for joining us today. I think we've got a great topic, a great speaker. Just thrilled to be here. It is my honor today to introduce Professor Hassan Kwame Jeffries. Professor Jeffries is Associate Professor of History at The Ohio State University, where he teaches courses on the civil rights movement and the civil rights and the black movement. Professor Jeffries is the author of the highly influential and award-winning book, Bloody Lounds, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt. Bloody Lounds has been praised as an invaluable contribution to understanding race and politics in America. Professor Jeffries is also the editor of Understanding and Teaching the Civil Rights Movement, a collection of essays by leading civil rights scholars. The book includes Professor Jeffries' essay on movies and documentaries for learning about the civil rights movement. Professor Jeffries is one of the featured commentators in the documentary Black America Since MLK and Still I Rise, and he is the host of the Teaching Hard History podcast. We are thrilled to have him here today to present on this topic. And with that, I'll hand it over to Professor Jeffries. Well, Barb, thank you very much uh, for the introduction uh, and most especially for the invitation uh, to join you and the community um, of academic library folk uh, to share some thoughts and ideas uh, on, on, this, on the topic uh, of confronting, confronting hard history. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my, my screen now um, with my PowerPoint. Slides. There we go. Uh, it's like magic, ladies and gentlemen, um, in the era of Zoom. Uh, confront, confronting hard history, uh, using primary sources uh, to teach slavery, civil rights, and Black Lives Matter. Uh, I, I have a few slides uh, that I want to share with you all, um, share a few thoughts and ideas, and then uh, take us to about 15 minutes or so uh, to the top of the hour, uh, and then save that time uh, to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Um, and if we don't get to those questions, then uh, we will uh, please put them in the chat uh, and then we'll create an opportunity uh, for, for, for a response uh, after the session, the session is over. So 
Confronting hard history. Uh, begs the question, of course, what is hard history? Well, hard history refers to those aspects of our past, of our collective's past, our, our past as a nation, that make us uncomfortable about our present. Hard history, those aspects of our past that make us uncomfortable about our present. Examples. Uh, American slavery as an example of hard history. I've had the opportunity uh, over the last couple of years uh, to take students from the Ohio State University to James Madison's plantation estate, uh, Montpelier. Uh, James Madison, of course, was the fourth president of the United States, uh, the architect of the Constitution, the, the father of the Bill of Rights. But James Madison uh, was also an enslaver. James Madison enslaved over 100 people over the course of his lifetime, and he never freed a single soul. Uh, and, and more to the fact, James Madison was also a third generation enslaver. Uh, his father, Ambrose, his grandfather, Ambrose, started things off. His father continued, and he picked uh, right up with it. So slavery wasn't something that he did on the side. Slavery was enslaving people, holding people in bondage was the family business. And so over the last couple of years, uh, I've been able to take small groups uh, to James Madison's Montpelier. And when we go, the first place we, we stop, the first place we visit uh, when we hit his uh, plantation estate is his library. And this is an image uh, of his library uh, with a view out on uh, this, 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 this panoramic uh, view uh, of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And this is literally the room where Madison conceived and conceptualized the Bill of Rights. But after we spend a few minutes there, uh, really absorbing uh, this place where important history had happened, uh, I take my students to the basement. Uh, and in the basement, uh, I ask them to run their hand uh, or hands along the cellar walls. Uh, and when you do that, you will feel these ridges, these impressions in the, the, the brick uh, along the face of the brick. And when you, when you stop and pause and, and look at what it is that you're actually feeling, you'll realize that these are actually handprints. Uh, but they're not the handprints of adults, they're the handprints of children. The handprints of children embedded in the bricks uh, in the cellar of, of Madison's mansion. How did that come to be? Well, that came to be because all of the bricks on the plantation uh, and the mansion of James Madison were made by the children that Madison enslaved. All of them, that was their job at age four, five, six and the like. And it wasn't just on Madison's plantation. Thomas Jefferson did the same thing at Monticello, uh, Washington at Mount Vernon, right? Like this was the task assigned to children, to African-American children, to enslaved children. And so that juxtaposition of the library, the room in which the Bill of Rights is conceived and conceptualized, resting on a foundation of bricks made by the children that Madison enslaved, that's hard history. We, we have to, that's hard to wrap our mind around, but that's exactly what we have to do. The Civil Rights Movement, as an example of hard history. I've had the good fortune of being able to work with um, the, the folk at the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel uh, helped with the uh, multi-year, uh, multi-million dollar renovation uh, of the exhibits uh, there uh, between 2009 and 2014. Uh, but I'm always struck that when we talk about the civil rights movement, the black freedom struggle, and specifically when we talk about uh, the role of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, we tend to avoid those aspects of his life that make us uncomfortable. Uh, and, and one of the aspects of his life that make us uncomfortable is his death. You know, Martin Luther King didn't die of old age. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Martin Luther King was killed uh, for his activism uh, because he was fighting for uh, civil and human rights for black folk. Uh, and and we, we just tend not to talk about that. You know, we tend not to talk about the fact that on April 3rd, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King was one of the most despised uh, people in America. Uh, he's assassinated on April 5th, 
And then on April 6th, we celebrate him. Uh, and so again, civil rights movement is hard history. Those aspects about the civil rights era that make us uncomfortable. What does it mean that he was assassinated? What does it mean that he wasn't uh, always celebrated in the ways in which we celebrate him now? And then looking at the present, the Black Lives Matter movement as hard history, those aspects of our past and our present that make us uncomfortable. Well, one of the principal objectives, one of the main goals of the Black Lives Matter protests uh, is seeking justice for those, who, for those Black folk and their families who have been victims of police violence. Police violence is hard history. Um, we know uh, the best, uh, based upon the best records that are available, uh, that at least over the last decade, on average, police have killed uh, 1,000 people every year. 1,000 people every year. And among those, uh, among that number, uh, roughly about 350 every year are African Americans. So every year, uh, police over the last decade uh, have killed uh, some 350 African Americans. Police violence has hard history. What, what does that mean? How do, we, how do we make sense of that number? If you compare that to the number of people uh, who, were, who were murdered by lynch mobs during the height of the era of lynching, it's three times as many per year. In other words, during the height of lynching in the 19 teens, roughly two African Americans uh, were murdered publicly every year, about uh, 100 uh, publicly every week, about 100 every year. Police now murder, kill three times that number. We have to wrap our minds around what does that mean uh, and how does that impact a, uh, not just a family, uh, but a community uh, and a nation. Uh, whether someone uh, is murdered publicly uh, by a rope around their neck or they die publicly uh, with a knee on their neck, what does that signaling say? How does that impact a community? Where does that come from? And where do we go from there? That's hard history, but that's something that we absolutely have to confront. So, but what do we do? Instead of, and by we, I'm using the royal we, what do we do as a collective, as a nation, uh, in responding to hard history? Well, we don't, what we do, we don't do it very well. Uh, one of the things that we do is we latch on to purposeful historical amnesia. Uh, we pretend that those difficult elements of the past that we don't want to confront just simply didn't exist. Uh, when we think about slavery, for example, uh, we say slavery, I'm in Ohio, uh, we say slavery was something that happened down there, happened down south, right? Ohio came into the, the Union as a free state, 1803, right? Ohio's on the right side of history didn't have slavery, didn't permit slavery here. Yeah, well, the reason why they didn't permit slavery here in 1803 is because white Ohioans didn't want black folk here in, the, here in the state, right? I mean, it was, they believed fully and equally in white supremacy, but we just dropped that off, pretend it didn't happen. I'm originally from uh, New York, from Brooklyn, New York. Growing up, we never, in, in the public schools in New York City, we never learned anything about slavery in New York. Uh, slavery existed in New York until 1827. Uh, it existed in my mother's home state of Connecticut until 1848. Uh, the fact that we don't talk about that, uh, that's purposefully forgetting because we don't want to deal with the ramifications and implications uh, of what, what that would mean. Purposeful historical amnesia. The other typical response that we, that we have collectively uh, is we tend to uh, rationalize, uh, uh oh, I'm sorry, we tend to rationalize evil. Let me get back here. There we go. We tend to rationalize evil. When you ask uh, uh, docents, uh, when I head back to Montpelier or, or visit Monticello and, and I ask the docents there, well, what do people say uh, when uh, you tell them that a Jefferson or a Madison or a Washington uh, held people in bondage, that they were enslavers and that they refused to let folk go and track them down when they did uh, attempt to escape? Uh, as freedom seekers, like, what, what, do you, what do they say? It's like, number one question, but weren't they good masters? But weren't they good masters? Like that's attempting to rationalize evil. The fact that you can 
uh, form those words on your lips. They, and they must be good people anyway, right? And I understand where it comes from because we, 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 we celebrate uh, enslavers uh, all of our lives, right? I mean, President's Day, we talk about uh, those folk uh, as heroes of the nation uh, and without talking about uh, their involvement in the uh, bondage and enslavement of others. And so naturally, we try to reconcile the two and we try to do that by rationalizing evil. Uh, talking about Thomas Jefferson and his relationship with a 14, 15 year old Sally Hemings as some, uh, 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 you know, sort of spring, summer romance, right? Jefferson in Paris. Jefferson was 45 years old when uh, he impregnates uh, Sally Hemings, uh, enslaved girl uh, who he claims ownership over. Uh, that's not uh, a romance, that is rape. Uh, but to, to call it a romance uh, is attempting to rationalize evil. And the third thing that we do uh, in our response to hard history is we just make stuff up. We just create false narratives. This is what the lost cause is. This is what this obsession with the Confederacy is. That's just making stuff up, right? That the, that the Confederacy uh, was not founded principally to maintain the institution of slavery. That's exactly uh, what the Confederacy was about. That's exactly what the Civil War was about. Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy out of Georgia, said as, as clear as day that the cornerstone of the Confederacy uh, is slavery. And to say anything else uh, is to create a false narrative. And so rather than confronting hard history directly, these are the three things that we do. Uh, we pretend things didn't happen, we try to rationalize evil of the past, or we just simply make stuff up. The problem with that as it relates to the African-American experience, is that we then take those myths and misconceptions and create a new myth about the Black experience. And we frame this myth about the Black experience as being perpetual progress, right? That things may have been bad once, uh, but by golly, um, things always get better. So yeah, you had slavery, uh, but you had a Frederick Douglass who spoke up and then uh, slavery ends, thank goodness. And then you go right from Frederick Douglass to Martin Luther King and it has said nothing about Jim Crow, has said nothing about um, lynching and peonage uh, and segregation in the South and outside the South. But we're gonna go from Frederick Douglass to Martin Luther King and we don't know why he's preaching, but he's preaching about something. Uh, and then he dies, but we ain't gonna say why he died, but we got King and he overcame. And then we're gonna go from Martin Luther King, perpetual progress to Barack Obama. So now you got a black president. Right and at the moment of the moment you get the black presence, and now we're going to have these conversations about, um, you know, are we now post-racial? Well, clearly we ain't post-racial. All you got to do is, well, we'll leave that for another slide. Uh, but this myth of perpetual progress uh, is, is not only ahistorical; it's also dangerous. It's ahistorical because we know uh, that American history is really about opportunities won, hard won, hard fought, and won, uh, such as. Um, the, the African Americans participating in the American Revolution, fighting on the side of freedom, but then those opportunities lost. The moment that you have um, um, uh, America gaining its independence, it can decide, do we want to be a nation uh, that is free of slavery or a nation that's dependent upon slavery? And so that opportunity one is lost uh, when we engage not only in gradual abolition uh, outside of in the northern colonies, uh, but also uh, when we create structures to support and maintain uh, and protect the institution of slavery uh, in the South uh, for nearly a century and would last for nearly a century more. But it's dangerous. That's the ahistorical part. Uh, but it's dangerous because if, if, the, if the narrative is perpetual progress, things always get better without ever looking at the ways in which opportunities are squandered without ever taking seriously the way how people have to fight to create change. Well, then the way you create change is just be patient. Just let change occur, right? Let, let time pass. If, if things always get better, then the solution to the problems that black folk face, the solution to oppression and marginalization is simply the passage of time. But time is not a social force. Time is just, is simply a marker, right? A measurement, uh, time, by itself doesn't change anything. Uh, people change things. Uh, and so it's, we have to push back against this normative narrative of African-American history, this, this arc uh, that things always get better uh, because ahistorical, problematic, 
and doesn't actually explain, explain either the past or the present. So what should we do? And this is where uh, we want to talk about uh, primary, primary sources. So what should we do? How do we challenge the normative narrative? I want to talk about slavery first, uh, and then civil rights, and then um, uh, the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, one of the things, and, and thinking about primary sources uh, is so critically important, and, and ProQuest uh, really has made available uh, such a rich array of primary source material and primary source documents. And this is, you know, obviously scholars, you know, are dependent upon primary sources for their original research. That we get, we understand. Uh, but even um, teachers increasingly uh, during these days are turning to primary resources because they provide uh, their students uh, with such rich opportunities to go beyond what's in the textbook. And what's in the textbook too often uh, has been too narrowly conceived uh, and has reinforced um, just as many myths and misconceptions as it has in providing uh, people with a way to understand the past as well as the present. There are any range, any number of primary sort of source, primary documents and primary source material that can be used to challenge uh, these normative narratives. Um, I chose to look at, just as an example, petitions to Southern legislatures, uh, which are housed in the collection, the history vault of the, uh, of ProQuest. Uh, between 1777 and 1867, there's roughly about 3,000 that have been preserved and maintained. Uh, and, and what do you get from these petitions, right? That what, what, what's in them uh, that, can, that we can look at that can challenge this normative narrative of what slavery was? Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about what some of those characteristics are uh, as, as we go through a couple of these quick points. Well, one, there's, there's a number of petitions in there uh, that are written by enslavers, uh, people who claimed ownership over other people, white folk who claim ownership over uh, African, African-American folk, who are seeking competition, uh, compensation. So these are uh, what I call runaway compensation petitions. Uh, and, and, you know, so, you know, you know, in, enslaved person uh, Mark runs away from enslaver Madison. Ensl enslaver Madison ain't happy, uh, and then is petitioning the state legislature uh, for some kind of recompense, right? Um, and you know, one for one example was uh, an enslaver, uh, an African American escaped, uh, was recaptured uh, in 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 uh, South Carolina, I think it was. Uh, and then, but wasn't identified uh, to the person who claimed ownership over him, uh, over that enslaved person. And so uh, the city sold uh, back into slavery, auctioned uh, that enslaved person, that free person, African-American, uh, back into slavery. Uh, and so this enslaver uh, was then petitioning the state legislature for compensation uh, for having his quote unquote property uh, sold out from under him. So how does this, a story like that, how does a story like that uh, help us challenge the normative narrative of slavery? Well, uh, it tells us that black folk resisted, uh, that black folk just simply weren't. The fact that this is a uh, uh, seeking comp compensation for someone, for a freedom seeker, someone who took off, said to hell with this, I'm out of here. Now, not everybody was able uh, to exercise that option, uh, but many did. Uh, but this is so critically important. Uh, pointing out the resistance of African Americans to enslaved folk, because resistance is the way uh, that most people are able to connect to the humanity of those they have otherwise no connection to, especially marginalized groups. Uh, and so we see with young people and with students, the first thing they want to know uh, when they really begin to wrap their minds around the institution of slavery, it's like, well, if it's so bad, then, then how do black folk respond? And if we don't leave with resistance, then they're like, wait a minute, you know, well, I don't want to associate with that. I can't connect with that. We already have an empathy gap, right? It's already easier for our, our young people, for our students, for ourselves even, to connect with enslavers than it is to the enslaved. It's easier to connect. Uh, we're conditioned to connect uh, and empathize with George Washington uh, than we are uh, with Ona Judge, the, the enslaved woman who uh, escaped from his 
uh, from his uh, ownership, right? So the runaway compensation petitions, although written uh, from, uh, penned by enslavers, uh, points to African-American resistance. And African-American resistance, identifying that resistance, creates this bridge or bridges the empathy gap uh, between us today and marginalized oppressed groups of the past. It also is an indictment uh, of enslavers themselves. And this is critically important because so often when we talk about slavery, like we talk about it in sort of the abstract, right? As though slavery existed without ever talking about enslavers. And, and when we talk about sort of when you look at these petitions, it's like, wait a minute, these people are trying to reclaim um, possession of people that they are categorizing as property, as their property, right? So there's no denying uh, their not just complicity, but their active work uh, in the enslavement and bondage of other human beings. Freedom petitions. These are exciting. Uh, from enslaved African Americans uh, and from free Blacks uh, who are uh, submitting petitions to state legislatures, uh, saying for whatever, any number of reasons, you know, you know, they are entitled to their freedom. Either uh, they were, for example, uh, listed in the will as being owed their freedom, uh, and then they were denied that after the, uh, after the person uh, who claimed ownership of them died, whatever it was, or free blacks, uh, you know, saying, you know, petitioning a state legislature to recognize their freedom or to stay, for example, in Virginia, uh, after Virginia passes a law saying that free blacks got to go. Uh, and, and what's so powerful about these petitions is that they often, sometimes written uh, by African Americans, sometimes written on behalf of African Americans, but they offer, they offer this view into the life of these folk, right? Again, humanizing African Americans, providing a glimpse of their life experiences because they often tell of their life story, tell of, you know, sort of them as a master carpenter or a weaver or a basket maker or a, uh, a wheelwright, talking about where they were from and how they wound up to be in the positions that they were. Uh, so we don't, we have too few first person narratives of black folk during these eras, during this era, but these petitions provide us this glimpse into the lived experiences of both free blacks and African-Americans, humanizing them. So they don't simply become project, uh, uh, property, um, objects of someone else's possession, slaves. They become people who happen to find their, uh, a particular legal status, enslavement, uh, or uh, the black folk who have been able to escape bondage. Challenging the master narrative by humanizing black folk by looking at their lived and life experiences. And then finally, there's this whole category of pet petitions around black behavior, right? Like black folk acting up, uh, black folk drumming and people petitioning. It's like, hey, these black folk down in the, you know, down in the uh, uh, rice country, right? They, they, they drumming too much. We got to deal with that state legislature, right? So you think you got a problem with Karens now, imagine what that was like. Uh, you know, 200 years ago, right? And, and so these petitions uh, really speak to that gulf between what's on the books, black folks shouldn't assemble, and the live reality. People saying, wait a minute, black people are assembling, right? Black people are getting together, right? And so again, uh, we're, we're, we're humanizing, granting and acknowledging and recognizing the agency uh, of African Americans uh, by looking and reading between the lines, right? Like the law is on the books, but this is what they're doing. Uh, and so that's, again, a way to, to challenge this normative narrative of Black folk either being complicit uh, or simply on the sidelines uh, of, their own, of their own enslavement. And then lastly, one of the, another one of the ways that these claims, um, petitions, uh, uh, challenge the normative narrative of Black experience uh, in slavery is that it offers these insurance claims uh, that enslavers put forward, right, for African Americans and slave folk uh, who may have been lost at sea, uh, who may have uh, been um, killed uh, during an insurrection, uh, they provide a look uh, at the microeconomics of slavery. Like too often when we talk about the institution of slavery, uh, when we talk about the business side of it, we talk about it at, at, at sort of a macro level, right? Like this is the total value of enslaved people. And this is the way railroads uh, contributed to this. But we don't talk about the ways in which individuals the microeconomics, the regional economics of the institution of slavery, right? And that personalizes it in a way that we simply can't get when we're just looking at uh, large scale banking transactions, right? These insurance claims, people are saying like, look, this person I valued at X, Y, and Z, I purchased this person from 
you know, at this time and place that really talks about, and then they're, how they're considering their labor uh, and valuing it. That really gets to the micro level, right? Of like, this, this isn't just something that was foisted upon people, right? Rationalizing evil. They ain't know any better. They were just doing what everybody else did. No, no, no. They knew what they were doing uh, and they pursue it with great vigor. Challenging the uh, normative narrative of the, of, the, of the civil rights movement using primary sources. ProQuest, ProQuest um, has a wonderful collection of the NAACP paper, papers. And the NAACP, National Association of Advancement of Colorful, Colored People, um, and, and it, it's, a, it's a massive collection, right? Like nobody can, nobody in their lifetime, nobody in their right mind would try to go through all of the NAACP papers, right? It's just too much. Um, but, you know, we're covering, you know, I think ProQuest has from 1909 to 1970s, right? So more than half a century. But there are a number of uh, elements, and I use this in my own work for my, for my dissertation, for my first book, using it now. Um, when you look at just, just, two, just two of the categories, the branch department files, in other words, the NAACP has its national office, but then it has its uh, local branches. Um, and the camp, uh, files on major campaigns, those major campaigns and major issues, right? So voting rights, various marches and demonstrations. When you look at that, when you look at those materials and begin to pull that material out, that does a number of different things that challenges the normative narrative of the civil rights movement. Uh, one, it expands the time and place that we usually consider the civil rights movement uh, to be. We narrowly, too narrowly, and still do this, too narrowly confine it to that period of 1954 to 1965. So the Brown decision uh, to the passage of the Voting Rights Act, uh, and we may push it to 1968, the assassination or the death of Martin Luther King. When you look at the NAACP papers, you can't help but go back in time, right? You can't help but look at the ways in which uh, African-Americans were challenging white supremacy, were challenging Jim Crow, were challenging their oppression and marginalization long before 1954. Right. I mean, even in 1909, when the organization is first founded, but when you look at sort of the branch records, people are talking about the earlier efforts that they had. So here you get almost a half a century of pre activism uh, or pre movement activism uh, that is just as important as anything that will occur uh, in the 19, 1950s and 1960s. And you also see that the movement wasn't just confined to the South. Right. Uh, that there is that you have branches engaged in uh, a struggle for basic civil rights and human rights throughout the country, right? Here in Ohio, in Michigan, uh, in New York, out West, wherever you have branches, uh, you have black folk. And wherever you have black folk, you have people resisting white supremacy and their oppression. Uh, the looking at these uh, branch files and major campaigns, and these are, these are letters that are people are writing, petitions that they're submitting, correspondence that's going to the national office. Uh, we also see uh, that it, ev it provides evidence, evidences, African-Americans' freedom rights goals broadly configured, their, their, their civil rights objectives and their human rights objectives, right? Like black folk in the civil rights movement too often, uh, when we think about it or, or talk about it, we say, oh, they just wanted legislation. They wanted federal legislation. Yeah, they wanted that too. They wanted the basic federal protections, but they wanted more than that, right? They wanted access to decent housing. They wanted access to quality schools. They wanted personal safety, um, freedom from racial terror. Uh, whether it was from a white mob or it was from uh, down in, in Alabama or whether it was a white mob uh, in Detroit uh, in, in the 1920s. Uh, and so the branch files really get at the broad range of African-American goals and objectives that they were trying to pursue, uh, pushing back against the narrow framing that we too often have. The NAACP uh, papers, they decenter King. One of the major problems of the, uh, of the normative narrative of the civil rights movement, what Julian Bond activists called the master narrative, is that it, it, it revolves too much around Martin Luther King Jr. And not even a fully fleshed, fully formed Martin King, a Martin King frozen on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial preaching about colorblindness and not talking about uh, the case for reparations as he did in that very same speech, not talking about the need uh, not to be silent and, and the importance of not being patient, saying that we can't wait uh, as long as police brutality exists anywhere uh, in this in this country, uh, and so it decenters King, and you can't help but decenter King uh, when you're looking at papers uh, about uh, primary sources that are talking about a struggle for freedom that don't mention King that are occurring before 
king is on the scene and before he is even born. And that becomes so critically important for our understanding that this movement was never um, uh, about one person, uh, couldn't be about one person, uh, because the oppression, uh, racism, and discrimination wasn't directed at just one person. These, looking at these files, spots, spotlights women and local leadership. Uh, the, when, you, when, you, when you see the correspondence, who's writing it? Uh, what are they talking about? Who's leading uh, these boycott, economic boycott campaigns in the 1930s and 40s down in Baltimore? These are black women. Uh, who's in Arkansas? Black women, right? Daisy Bates. And so uh, we see, uh, again, just looking at the correspondence, putting the paper in the hands of, the, uh, uh, of students and the people, right? Letters. Uh, you see this long history of activism. Uh, one of the um, one letter, one uh, memo letter that I use uh, in my classes with my students uh, is a letter uh, coming out of Montgomery, Alabama uh, in 1947. Uh, and it's a letter written to uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, who was the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, and it's, it's soliciting or asking for uh, some help in investigating uh, police violence in one of the surrounding counties surrounding Montgomery, Alabama, uh, local sheriffs beating up black folk. Uh, and then if you look in the, uh, who sent it is signed by uh, the, the director of the, executive director of the Montgomery branch, which was uh, E.D. Nixon at the time, uh, but it's typed by the secretary of the Montgomery branch of the NAACP in 1947, uh, Mrs. Rosa Parks. Uh, and so there, that just complicates, right? Like Rosa Parks is in some, you know, Ty is seen, old lady, right? He was 42 years old, which means he's younger than me than now, uh, sitting on a bus, right? She has a lifetime of activism. Uh, and that one small memo written to the national office out of Montgomery, Alabama really speaks to that, testifies to that history. And it's a great way to get students to think about uh, the role of women, the role of iconic figures, and also the role of local leaders uh, in the movement. Uh, these records show the wide range of strategies and tactics. You know, in some places, people are boycotting. Some places, people are engaged in direct action. Kansas, for example, uh, in the 1950s, Clara Luber. Uh, and in other places, people are debating, you know, sort of armed self-defense, right? Robert F. Williams out in Monroe, North Carolina, uh, NAACP uh, branch. And so we see the wide range of strategies and tactics. This isn't just sort of a nonviolent crusade. Uh, when you look at the full scope of African-American activism, uh, and the branch papers, you know, they, they really, NAACP papers really speak, uh, speak to that. And they also make clear the obstacles and opposition, right? Black folk, uh, as they're writing from their local branches, uh, aren't talking about, you know, and, you know, in, in these very general terms, right? That, you know, about what the problem is or what the problems are. Uh, they're naming names, right? They're like, the mayor is the problem, right? And, you know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the and, and not only naming names, they're, they're laying out the structure, right? Like we can't uh, move into, in Chicago, we can't move into these particular neighborhoods and these, and this, and these are the reasons why. Uh, and so we, it becomes clear uh, that sometimes the issue uh, is personal prejudice and people are identifying that in their correspondence. But most often uh, it's about the systemic ways in which uh, racism is maintained, racial discrimination is maintained and upheld. And you really get a sense for that, not just again in the South, but across the nation uh, when you look at these files. And then lastly, uh, these papers really redefine what are victories and defeats, right? Because we're not just talking about um, efforts designed solely to gain access to or, or gain federal legislation, right? Gain bill passed. Like people are like, yeah, you know, we tried to desegregate or we tried this voting rights campaign. And, you know, in the end, we registered a handful of people. Uh, and people are looking at that as a defeat, you know, down in Mississippi. But you know what? We activated so many black folk, right? Like so many people attempted to register to vote that although the numbers uh, in, in Clarksdale may be small, uh, the fact that so many were willing to risk their lives to get out, like that's not a defeat, that's a victory. Uh, and people are talking about it in those particular terms. And when we look at it at the ground, we look at these primary sources, uh, they really allow us to explore that. And the last point, um, the la that last slide here is, you know, how can we use primary sources um, to challenge the normative narrative of uh, what we're seeing today, the Black Lives Matter movement? And this is really important because this isn't anything that ProQuest has that I know of yet, right? Because this is still ongoing. 
Uh, but as, as, as members of the sort of academic library community, as archivists uh, and the like, we really have to take advantage of the moment that we are in uh, and archive in real time. Like collecting isn't just about things that are happening in the past. Uh, collecting and archiving needs to occur right now. Uh, when we think about the black, the, we think about the protests around Black Lives Matter that have been occurring this summer, uh, since May through the present. Uh, when these protests were at their height in early June, uh, 2020, early June, you're talking about as many as some estimates have as 25 million people taking to the street at the same time, uh, over consecutive days across the country. That means that we are witnessing the largest public protests in American history. And it ain't even close, right? The March on Washington was the largest single day demonstration during the civil rights movement. Uh, and that had 250,000 people max. Uh, the Women's March uh, in January of 2017 uh, was, uh, since, that, since that point up until now, uh, was the largest single day of public protest in American history. And that had about 3 million people max. So we're talking about 20 to 25 million people taking to the streets uh, over um, several days and then continuing in lesser numbers, but continuing uh, for several months. So this is history happening right now. Uh, and, and it's important uh, that we uh, take advantage of this to collect and document and to archive in the moment. And what, what, what could that look like? What should that look like? Um, you know, I say we have to take advantage and, and begin to keep an eye on the signs of the times. Like literally, uh, the signs that people have been taking with them into the streets, um, the posters, the bulletin boards, the handmade signs, because the signs literally speak to the people's demands, right? And if you could recall the, um, the March on Washington uh, had, uh, and if you, anyway, you just close your eyes or you Google it now, right? Images of the March on Washington, you'll see these pre-printed plans, uh, uh, posters and banners that talk about what it was that people were fighting for, right? A, a universal wage, uh, decent housing, um, uh, you know, uh, jobs for everyone, minimum a universal income, right? These are all printed signs. Well, the signs that we are seeing on the streets today aren't uh, pre-printed, uh, but they really speak to collectively what it is that black folk were fighting for, justice for the victims of racial violence and racial terror. A uh, demand for a recognition of black humanity, a, a demand for telling the truth about the hard history of the past, pushing back against um, the uh, creating monuments and memorials to white to white supremacy. So signs of the times, right? Collecting those signs it would be really important, especially locally. Uh, many of us are at universities. Many of our university students were a part of these um, protests. Many of them still have signs, right? And I know because I'm zooming into the class and with, with, while I'm online now with zooming, I can see in the dorm room, like, oh, you at the protest, I see the sign you got right there. Right? We have to uh, take advantage of that opportunity and see about collecting and preserving those, uh, not just as ephemera, not just because they're nice and they're artistic, but because they actually reflect and can, and can speak to uh, the demands that people had at the time. Video and photographs, so much of what we are seeing now um, is, is available and being shared online, right? Um, people taking uh, videos with their cell phones, uh, photographs of, of, of movement protests, of planning, right? Of after effect, of, 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 of interactions with police. Uh, all that uh, is so critically important uh, because it will help us uh, document the moment, but then also look back and say, okay, what is it that we are seeing? Uh, and how does this uh, compare? right, to, you know, sort of myths and narratives that are already being spun about this is overwhelming, this is about people being violent and destructive. Well, you know, that, the evidence does, isn't there for that. Certainly there are small incidents of it, right, um, but by the best count, uh, 95, 95% of all uh, the public uh, protests and demonstrations uh, were, were peaceful and nonviolent for, for however you want to um, define or, 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 or uh, uh, whatever value judgment you want to put on that. But the videos and the photographs uh, are, are impressive and important. I mean, just imagine if you had uh, that kind of film footage of organizing that was taking place in Mississippi, right? Uh, of, of folk who were fighting for their freedom uh, in slavery, right? I mean, this is a gift uh, that we have now and we need to um, think uh, uh, constructively and productively about how to, um, uh, about how to preserve it uh, you know, get some, get some, get some terabytes uh, and, and, and make that happen. 
And then finally, social media posts, right? Like this is also an area, again, digital, but social media plays such an important role in, in, in organizing folk and bringing people out and not just in sort of announcing events, yes, but then also sharing information, right? Instagram accounts, posts that, that then uh, get widely circulated. This also speaks to people's motivations and people's understanding, right? And this isn't just on the, you know, the, the hey, let's have, uh, you know, I, I'm supportive of Black Lives Matter, but also what have those who have opposed it been circulating? What myths and misconceptions, right, have they been sharing, right? Untruths have they been sharing as well? Uh, we know, for example, uh, during the 1960s, it was always the myth of the, of the, of, of the Negro sniper, right? Uh, which then justify um, extreme military measures against demonstrators, right? Like up in Newark, in, 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 in the public housing in Newark, right? We're going we're gonna to fire, the, the New Jersey National Guard is going to fire into these public housing towers because they got word that there's a sniper up on the roof. Sniper never found, uh, but yet bullets uh, are being shot into people's homes. Uh, we see the same thing playing out on social media, but it can be captured, it can be documented, right? Like how is that, you know, on the, on the opposition side, how is that material uh, being circulated? So, you know, primary sources, whether we're talking about slavery uh, or civil rights or the current moment, uh, really can be helpful uh, to help us break down, to help us make sense of, uh, to help us complicate uh, the standard narratives about the African-American experience and the standard narratives about the ways in which Black folk have been fighting against uh, their marginalization and oppression through the years. And we have an opportunity right now um, as, as, as library professionals um, to do some of that heavy lifting, to do some of that work, uh, to make life a little bit easier uh, for those who will come after us uh, by providing them uh, some of the material, some of the primary sources that are being produced today uh, so that we can get this history right uh, when we attempt to do it tomorrow. Well, thank you very much. We have a little bit of time left. Uh, and so I'll, I'll invite, I'll stop sharing my screen, invite Barb back, uh, and then maybe yep. we can take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeffries. People were super engaged with what you were talking about. So we've got lots of questions here and I'll try to, I want to do a sampling of, because we went all over the place based on what you were talking about. So um, the first question I want to ask you is about, let me just find one here. Um, Protests are being seen differently, depending on who is doing it. How do we address it in a privileged classroom environment? Mm. Well, that's, huh. <laughs> yeah, th th there's, a, there's a lot there, right? Um, one of the things that we know uh, is the, the, sort of the, the general demographics um, about who has been taken to the streets uh, in the, this most recent iteration of Black Lives Matter protests. Still overwhelmingly young people under 35, 35 and under. So a lot of them are our students, um, high school students, college students, young adults, young, young, young professionals. Uh, but we also know that many of them uh, are of, uh, uh, particularly those above 35, are people of, of middle income uh, and of uh, more than modest means. Uh, now, now that's important because it does speak to the privilege, right? Like who has the actual opportunity uh, to come out and protest and demonstrate, right? Like who's, who, you know, who, you know, who's not an essential worker? Right, who can leave work, uh, you know, and or not be, because when the middle of the global pandemic has been able to work from home, or not been able to work from home, and therefore uh, has the flexibility to come on out. Like that's that's critically important, right, to sort of put into context who who is actually taken to the streets. But we should not just focus on them. We also have to look at who is unable to, who wants to but is unable to. Uh, I had a student in a, in, in a seminar most recently, and and she made a brilliant point, Carica. So shout out to Carica. I know she's not no she's not watching, but shout out to Carica anyway. And she was like, you know what? You know, one of the things that, you know, in, in this moment in time, like, yeah, it may be easier to get more people out. So maybe we shouldn't. Um, it's always it's still it, it still takes a lot to get people to the streets. But she was like, well, maybe we shouldn't be evaluating or assessing um, the the these protests um, solely based upon the numbers. Maybe we should look at you know you know how long people are involved, right? Like, like the, you know, in, in terms of, so not just the moment, but then the duration uh, as opposed to the past. And that's interesting, right? Because that's a different take on, on just sort of the numbers game that we look at the past. A, a march is successful if you get X number of people. Well, maybe a march is successful, a protest is successful uh, if you get people sustained for, a, sustained for a, a longer period of time. Maybe that's what we need to be thinking about. So I think in answer to the question, I say, yeah, 
we got to look at the people. It's important to understand the demographics, but we also have to look at who's not out there and, and, the, and, and, and have a fair and accurate assessment of the reasons why uh, they are not participating in the same way. Great. Okay. Different changing gears. So are we making excuses or rationalizing evil when we say, well, it was a different time. They held different values. I've always been conflicted by that response. Should we hold historical figures to our modern values? I was trained that we have to provide those allowances and historical judgment. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I don't think we have to um, hold them, uh, two, two things. One, we don't have to hold people, um, well, let's get specific, right? Let's talk about enslavers, right? Let's talk about Madison, Jefferson, the, the, the framers, the founders, Madison, Jefferson, Washington. Like, we don't have to hold them to a contemporary standard. In order, to, in order to judge their, their, their values and their actions. We can hold them to the standard of the day. You know, in 1865, this was a little bit after them, right? But 1865, there's 4 million African Americans who are in bondage, right? If you ask any single one of them, well, what do you think about slavery? They're like, that ain't no good, right? Like, like, like what, what's the problem there, right? Problem, right? Um, so we can dismiss them, right? I mean, they're of the same time. They're, they're literally sharing the same experiences. And they're like, no, nah, no, nah, this ain't right. Right. Well, if all right, so fine. Well, maybe they maybe they're special, right? Maybe they just had you know the, the experience of slavery just wasn't working out for them. But everybody else was okay with it, right? Like no, right? Because even Jefferson, even Madison, even Washington, their boys, the people they had di their dinner parties with, right? Who Dolly Madison is making ice cream for, right? They're like, you know what? This is wrong, and y'all are foul, and y'all gonna pay a price for this. And if you look at their letters. Right, Madison like, and Jefferson, they're like, yeah, 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 we're gonna pay a price for this, right? Like, this ain't right, right? So we can, we don't even have to project onto them our 21st century values, right? We can look at, put them in the context of their own times, right? And they're, they're the people they are associating with are like, this is wrong, right? And so I think that is, that is critically important, but that is also separate. I know this wasn't the, quite the question, but we also see this coming up in this context, the question of monuments and memorials, right? Like if a monument and memorial, you know, is, you know, to the Confederacy uh, is put up in, you know, the 1920s or, or whatever, it, you know, 19 teens, which many of them went up, like, well, well, shouldn't we just, you know, just leave it, right? It's like, why would we do that, right? That God didn't come down and drop these monuments and memorials, you know, around, around the country, right? Like uh, the sign of a healthy society, right? Now, this isn't just, this isn't just sort of looking at making assessments of, you know, sort of what's in the archives. This is looking at and reflecting on the politics of the placement of monument and memorials in the public square. Now, see, that's different because those, that's always political. And I think a, a sign of a healthy society is going back and saying, hey, do these monuments and memorials reflect our, what we value as important in society today? Or are they relics of a distant past where the principles were different, uh, where white supremacy was publicly upheld? Right. And, and, and now we're trying to you're trying to get away from that. And so I think, yes, it is important to evaluate um, historical actors on their own terms. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they get a free pass. We have to look at the broader community in which they live. Uh, and, and if we do that, almost every time we will find folk who in the same circumstances who are like, you know what, this is just wrong. Right. And that's okay for us to say, you know, it's okay to be like, yeah, yeah, Jefferson was wrong. That, we'll survive. We'll get over it. It's totally fine. Hmm. Yeah, one of the uh, participants has also chimed in saying treating another human being with respect and dig dignity is never tied to a particular period in time. So, uh, okay. So how do you have these discussions when the college culture and environment may not be as open to having these hard conversations? Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, no, it's great. That's a great question. Um, and, and the reality is we don't have a choice but to do it, right? And, and we also have to, when you look at those 25 million people, many overwhelming majority of whom were young people, many of whom were our students, our college students, they have, they have demonstrated a, 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 a amazing courage uh, in taking to the streets in the middle of a global pandemic facing police uh, who are using, uh, who, who are not shy uh, about using force uh, to, control, uh, to control them. They are demonstrating amazing courage. If they can demonstrate that courage in the face of those challenges and obstacles, then we in the academy 
uh, can show at least a modicum of the same kind of courage to have these difficult and hard conversations uh, about these difficult subjects. And we have to push back, and this is important, we have to push back on the false equivalencies. Because when we're talking about hard history, when we're talking about sort of enslavers and, and civil rights and white supremacy, like we ain't making stuff up, right? Like this is actually stuff that happened. We're saying we need to confront the truth. To do anything else uh, is, to, is to commit educational malpractice. And we can't do that, right? And so we have to have the same courage that those young people have out in the streets. And I think they not only deserve it, but they also have been demanding that we do it. And they now have created the space within our society, not just our campuses, within our society to say, you know what, we got to have these conversations, right? When, when, you, when you click on amazon.com in the middle of the summer and it's like Black Lives Matter, we support Black Lives Matter, you know, that is called an opening, right? That you can, that's your permission, right? Like, look, Amazon said it, right? Siri said that Black Lives Matter. So we can at least have a conversation about that uh, here, in our, here on our campus. Yeah. So another question is, I wonder how you would suggest addressing tension within the civil rights movement historically, like W.E.B. Du Bois was critical of Booker T. Washington, or T. Marshall was critical of Martin Luther King, similar with Malcolm X. How do you, how do you address those sorts of tensions? Oh, one, you identify them and you say that this is, again, the sign of a, um, uh, of a healthy movement. There is no social movement where you don't have conflict, where you don't have disagreements. Now, whether it's Du Bois or Washington, they all agreed that, you know, freedom was the ultimate goal, but they disagreed on how to get there. They disagreed on, on you know, what would be most effective strategically and tactically. Uh, and so there's never a period where you don't have, I mean, real disagreements, right? Uh, on, on strategies and tactics, agreement on the end goal, but disagreement on how to get there. But that's where the learning is, right? If we just focus on one and sort of pretend that the others didn't exist or people didn't disagree, then we're not getting a good sense. Uh, we're not teaching the truth. We're not teaching the reality of what the movement was. And then sort of on a practical level, you know, we get kids on the ground now who are trying to organize people trying to do stuff uh, to really promote and bring about democracy. Uh, and then they get all flustered when people disagree with them because they're like, well, the movement had 100% unity. I'm like, what movement was that, right? I mean, so we, we do a disservice to uh, future generations uh, when we don't focus in on the conflict, when we don't focus in on disagreements, and even when we don't focus in on when things go awry, right? When people betray the movement, right? I mean, those, that's part of that hard history too. Uh, the, the last chapter of my book, Bloody Lounge, is about um, one of the leaders of the movement who moves in a direction that is totally antithetical to what the people have been fighting for. And I didn't want to write that chapter, right? I wanted to write on a high Hollywood happy ending, right? Like black power, right? Like everybody is happy. Like, no, there are critical lessons that need to be uh, understood that, that can be and should be taught uh, by those aspects uh, of the freedom movement uh, that are ugly, but are also not unique, not only to the freedom movement, but to any uh, movement for, for change. Perfect. Okay, we just have a few minutes left. So I would like to squeeze in one more question if I can from um, a person who works at a historically black college or university. And she asks, how do we have these conversations with black college students? I ask because they already know where they are safe to speak up and oftentimes higher education environments aren't the place. Yeah, well, look, as a, as a graduate of HBC, HBCU Morehouse College, um, I, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying. I have the best conversations I ever had um, in, uh, at, at any level were uh, while I was at Morehouse College. And they were partly conversations that I was having in the classroom and the Department of History, uh, but they were also conversations that I was having in the dormitory, uh, you know, in, in, in Thurman Hall, right? As, as, as you know, me, a brother from Brooklyn, was talking to brothers, um, you know, from Charlotte, North Carolina and, and California and a couple sisters who were hanging out with us too, right? Like, like the, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like the, 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 the black college space is so powerful because it's, it's an extension of the family uh, dining room table, right? And it's, and it's so rare in higher education that you actually have that. But, but the lesson that needs to be taught is not that you can't then have the same conversation outside of that space. It's that you have that same conversation, but in a different way. Like the black college space provides uh, the tools 
uh, for, for understanding the nature of the problems, but then also provide you with ways of framing issues uh, that and empowering and giving you that sense of self because you've had all these debates and arguments from all sides uh, that when you, when you head from Morehouse College, in my instance, up to Duke University, it's like, all right, yeah, it's on, right? Let's go, right? Like I had no problems whatsoever sort of engaging in those difficult debates and conversations because I was thoroughly prepared coming out uh, of that black college experience. Perfect. Well, we've got we're literally hundreds of questions here. So um, we will do our best to try to get them answered. But thank you all so much. Dr. Jeffries, thank you so much for doing this today for ProQuest and for all of our attendees. It's been fabulous. People have thoroughly enjoyed it. So I just wanted to thank you very much and thank everybody for attending today. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, th thank you for the opportunity uh, and thank everyone for participating. Uh, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue uh, in other formats <laughs> going forward. Perfect. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Stay safe out there. Excellent. Thank you. This is Mark from ACRL in Choice, just echoing the, the many thanks to you, Dr. Jeffries, and to ProQuest for putting this on. Um, I would just remind folks, as you sign off, you should be sent over to a, a quick survey. Please take a minute to fill that out to let us know how we did today. Um, if there were any technical issues that we weren't able to address or um, just to um, let us know how much you really appreciated the program. Um, we really appreciate you taking a moment to do that. Um, those surveys help us improve the offerings that we bring. All right. Thanks, everyone. We will hope to catch you on another webinar in the near future. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark.